Well, good morning. Thanks so much for the warm welcome. We just have been so blessed by so many of you who've reached out and encouraged us and blessed us and just uh, for your care for us along the journey. It's meant uh, a huge amount to us as we come together. And it feels like just an amazing honor and a unique privilege to be here uh, with you today. I'm really excited with the season that God has prepared for us ahead of us. I think Jesus is inviting us together into a really unique season to experience his blessing and his goodness, a unique relationship with him as we move forward together. And I thought today I wanted to do something different. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll dive back into the series in Mark. Uh, but today I wanted to do something a little bit different and just look at a passage that's been really critical to my own personal formation in Jesus. And also that I think is critical for us as a congregation to continue to move forward and experience all the fullness of what Jesus has for us uh, in the days ahead as well. So let's just uh, pray as we dive in together. Father, we thank you that you are good and mighty, you are strong, you are steadfast, you are glorious, and you are faithful. Lord, we are so thankful for the ways you care for each one of us uniquely. And Lord, here and now, at the beginning of this new season, we submit to your rule and your dominion. This is your church. Would you lead us together in the ways that you want us to go? We freely and we openly confess that apart from you, Lord, we can do absolutely nothing of lasting value. But Jesus, with you, everything is possible. So we ask today that you would open our eyes to see you, to experience more of you. In these moments, would you empower us to engage with you faithfully and well? Would the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer? Amen. All right, well, as the people of God, we recognize that there's nothing more important than our relationship with Jesus, to steadfastly walking with him and following him and engaging with him in whatever his purposes are for us in this generation. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you've read it through, it has this amazing list of people who serve God so powerfully and so faithfully in their time, even in the face of tremendous opposition. And then as we move to chapter 12, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we, the focus and the emphasis shifts so that we're no longer hearing stories of other people who are amazing and did fantastic things for God, the focus shifts to us. And how are we following God? What does it look like for us to faithfully pursue Him and all of His intention for us in our generation? And so this morning I want us to take a look at this passage and see how it guides and directs us to be the people that God is calling us to be. So Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people who've done amazing things before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful people so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Again, this is a beautiful passage, and we could camp out here for a very, very, very long time, but we shouldn't do that. Uh, so today we're just going to look at three particular tasks that this passage invites us into to live faithfully as the people of God in this moment and in this generation. Because the fascinating and the amazing thing is that God Almighty has prepared a race for us as a congregation together in the days ahead. And we want to be faithful as so many who have gone before us are, have been faithful to pursue him and to live out the fullness of what he wants for us in this generation and in this moment. Because God is doing amazing and powerful things right now and in this space. And so to position ourselves faithfully before him, we need to do these three things. And the first thing that we must do, our first task, is to get rid of everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Again, as the passage tells us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance this race marked out for us. I started running a couple of years ago because I thought it would be a fun idea around 40 that I should take up a new something. Uh, and so I began to run, and it gave me a whole new vivid perspective on what this passage is all about. And again, if I'm going to go out for a run, I don't want a whole lot of heavy things on me. I would never carry a backpack full of stuff because it's hard enough to drag my body around, let alone anything else that I might have to possibly carry with me. I want good shoes. I want nothing that's going to trip me up, nothing too baggy. I would want to make sure my shoes are tied up. I don't want to trip on anything. And this passage is reminding us that every single one of us, and us collectively as the people of God, are running a race at this moment. And we need to spiritually be prepared. 
We need to make sure that spiritually we're not carrying on any unnecessary weight. And that we're ridding ourselves of all kinds of things that would trip us up or slow us down. And the author points out to us there's two particular areas that we need to address. And the first one that's easier for us to understand is the idea of sin. Most of us can recognize the idea that sin are thing, sins are things that are an affront to God. They're an offense against him. And it just makes sense that if the most important and fundamental part of who we are is our relationship with Jesus, why would we engage with things that will slow us down from pursuing him? Why would we engage with things that are offensive to him or damaging to this relationship? And intellectually, we really understand this. But the interesting thing is that so often we still get caught up. We still get tripped up. We still get bound up and wrapped up in various aspects of sin. And can I ask you this morning, are there places where you're being caught and tripped up and entangled with sin? Again, for some of us, maybe it's this idea of greed. Maybe we just want so much stuff. Or maybe it's a little subtler. Maybe it's more like coveting. We just want what everybody else has. And our culture, this is a really huge challenge for us because we look around through advertising and the world around us and we see everybody else seems to have so many amazing things and we just want them. But it'll trip us up. Again, maybe it's lust or it's impurity that weaves its way into our hearts and lures us away, convincing us that we need to find satisfaction in something else other than in the presence of God. Maybe it's something like malice, this desire for harm to come on someone or some particular group of people, and it just subtly sneaks in because we're angry and we're frustrated. Maybe it's one of the really big uglies, like pride, this belief that somehow we are superior to the people around us. And pride weaves its way in so subtly and so easily and chokes the life out of us. Because in pride, we can't admit our failure and we can't admit our weaknesses. We can't grow closer to God because we have to prove that we have it all together. And these things stifle us and choke the life out of us. But I would be willing to bet that for a number of us this morning, some of the deepest issues that we're struggling with are bitterness and resentment. Again, this last season has not been kind to many of us. We've been forced to face harshness and realities that we never could have possibly imagined before. People have said and they have done tremendous and awful and unkind things, and these things damage and wound us deeply. And maybe as you come into this morning, there's still just this sense of heaviness. There's a sense of bitterness or anger or frustration with the world around you. Maybe there's unforgiveness that's creeping in your heart. People or groups of people that you are so resentful towards that you just can't let this level of frustration go until they somehow make it right. And you feel that you need to hold them accountable. And all this time, the bitterness is choking the life out of you. I'm convinced that for many of us this morning, the greatest obstacle to our experiencing Jesus in powerful and life-changing ways is the fact that we are bitter and we are resentful, that we have been profoundly and honestly wounded, but we don't know how to process that or to work that through well. And so in his grace and in his mercy, Jesus invites us on a journey of healing and a journey of forgiveness. And forgiveness is never simple, and it's almost never easy. And the deeper the wounds to our soul, the longer and the harder it is for us to journey through this process with Jesus, to release them fully, to let go of our need to hold someone or something or some group accountable to make changes within our life. And I think a season like the last one that we've been through is really hard because all of us can point to really honest and clear ways that we have been profoundly hurt. And the amazing nature of our faith is that we believe that Jesus suffered and he died. He took the full weight of all of the sins that we have committed, but also all of the full weight of all of the sins committed against us. And today I could say to you that the wounds that you've experienced in the last season or throughout the course of your life are real and they are awful and they are horrible. They are so profound and so deep that it takes the, the blood of Jesus to wash them clean. And Jesus has suffered and died so that we can walk free from these things. That we don't need to live trying to force the world to be the place that we wish that it was. We can simply let them go into the hands of the judge of all of the earth who will simply do what is right in his time and in his way. 
Again, whatever our sins may be, we never like to deal with these things, but for some of us, there are particular areas of sin that are holding us back, they are tripping us up, they are stifling and choking the oxygen off of our spiritual life. And just when things are getting remarkably uncomfortable in this idea of dealing with our sin, the author of the Hebrews also reminds us that we need to deal with anything that might possibly hinder. And now this could become in all kinds of different forms. The things that could hinder us might be things that are good and right and lovely in and of themselves, but they've just gotten too big. Again, it could be that you have a deep and a passionate love for sports or for a particular hobby, and this is so good. This is a gracious gift of God to give you something to delight in and to thrive in and to enjoy His blessing of your life. But if it ever becomes the primary thing, if this longing or desire or hobby ever becomes more important to you than Jesus, it is a hindrance. It would be like trying to run a race holding on to a big armful of hockey cards or maybe scrapbooking supplies or something, whatever you might possibly happen to be into. And again, these things are supposed to be good and life-giving but they just need to stay in their proper place or else they become something that hinders us. And I think for some of us today, what's really hindering us is our fears. And you know this because every time the Spirit of God prompts you into something new and exciting, fear just springs up. And you're so afraid maybe of what other people will think or you're afraid of getting hurt all over again or you're afraid of failing, and you say to yourself, I could never do this because I'm just so afraid of what might happen, and we talk ourselves out of it. We believe that somehow Jesus might not be enough to empower us to do what he's asking us to do, and so we simply say no, because we're just afraid, and it's hindering us. For some of us, it's also the lies that we believe, that we've told to ourselves, that other people have told us that we are ugly or we are dumb or we're incompetent or no one would ever see us or know us or care for us or we could never possibly do these things. And these lies have become so limiting on our soul that we won't believe the voice of Almighty God when He tells us to do something. We'll choose to believe this instead. And for some of us, this is the greatest obstacle to us experiencing more of Jesus and walking faithfully with Him. And none of us ever like to work through our stuff because it's messy. And we really want to look confident and we want to look strong and we want to look capable. But in order to actually be strong and competent and capable, we need to face these things with Jesus. And the beautiful gift of the gospel is that it's not up to me and it's not up to you to be able to sort these things out. Jesus has suffered and died to take away all these things, to empower us to be whole. He's not holding these things over us in condemnation, demanding that we make these things right. But as a loving father to children that he delights in, he says to me and he says to you, these things are damaging you. Will you let me take them? Will you allow me to help you to walk through a journey of healing to release them? I have something better for you. It's a gracious invitation. It's not a threat. And so the first task that he invites us into is to let go of everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And then he invites us into the second, maybe most important stage, the step of choosing to fix our eyes on Jesus. And again, we can be focused on anything and everything. Today, maybe as you're sitting here, you're not really thinking about this sermon at all. Maybe you're focused on lunch that's about to come. Maybe you're focused on the struggles going on in your family. Maybe you're focused on the fear that you have of how the world is playing out around you. Maybe you're focused on your business or uh, your own ambition or the things that you really hope or what the people around you are thinking of you. But whatever our primary focus is, that is the direction that our life will move. And so the author of the Hebrews says to us, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Not just glance at him occasionally, not just look at Jesus in a few minutes in your devotional time in the morning and on Sunday mornings and when you're with your life group. He's saying, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. I want you to live with your gaze, always with Jesus in mind. And the interesting thing is when we focus on Jesus, everything else changes. It's like putting on the perfect pair of glasses. They enable us to see all of life accurately and as it truly is. And so the author says to us, fix your eyes on Jesus. And when you do, everything else will come into its rightful perspective, as we sang about a few minutes ago. And so this is our invitation. I think Mel did an amazing job last week of explaining to us what this looks like in practice. 
We talked about the journey towards open heart surgery, and whenever the fear would move up in his soul, he would just listen to really good worship music, and the peace of Jesus would come all over again. It's a really good example of what it means to just fix our eyes back on Jesus. And the beautiful thing is that in every moment of every day, in every situation, the presence of Almighty God Himself is in you and with you through the person of the Holy Spirit if you believe in Jesus. And that means that no matter where we are or what we are wrestling through or what's going on in our life, God Himself is present with us. All that we need to do is choose to put and move our attention towards Him. In the moments where we're not sure what to do, we can look at Jesus who is himself all the fullness of divine wisdom for guidance and direction and insight. When we're in moments where we are betrayed and hurt and wounded, we can look towards Jesus for comfort and strength and capacity and care. In the moments of our lives where we are just rejoicing and having the time of our life, we can look towards Jesus and say, thank you. And as we see him and thank him, our joy is made complete. It resonates and it grows and it strengthens within us. Again, in every moment and in every circumstance, Jesus is inviting us to keep our eyes fixed on Him because when we do, everything changes. And today as we think about this idea of entering a new season together, I wonder what would it look like if we were a people who really followed the advice of this passage? If we were a church that had our eyes permanently fixed on Jesus, if our attention wasn't on me or on the amazing staff that we have or the fantastic building that we're in or the beautiful ministries that we get to experience or fear of what's going on in the world around us, if our focus and attention wasn't primarily on our own ambition or desires or joys or pursuits, what would we look like if Jesus was our consuming passion? if we could live with our focus permanently placed on him and see the rest of life and all the fullness of the world around us through the goodness that he is Lord and he is God and he is present within us, it would change absolutely everything. It would change our own experience. It would change our life as a church. It would change this city and it would change this world. And so as a really good gift, a father who loves us says to us, I will be with you always. Just fix your eyes on Jesus all the time. This is a possibility that he grants to us. Which moves us to our third task, which is to consider him so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. The passage finishes this way. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Again today, I just, we need to be honest. For so many of us today, we are profoundly weary. And some of us have even lost heart. I think weariness might be the defining attribute of life in Canada at this particular moment. There is a deep and a consuming weariness within our souls. And so the author invites us to say, in the moments of life where it is challenging, where it's painful, where it's hard, where we're wrestling through the hard things that don't make any sense, we need to consider Jesus. Because God knows that our life and relationship with him isn't one short sprint of a few great decisions that we make and then everything works out perfectly. He understands this is a marathon. And as Jesus himself told us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And so in the moments of our lives where there is trouble and hardship and pain and difficulty and betrayal and hurt and uncertainty and whatever we may be facing, the author says to us, you need to consider Jesus and remember the truth that he is still bigger, he is still stronger, he is still greater than whatever it is that you may be facing, that he is the sovereign Lord over all creation and he will bring everything out ultimately in the way that it ought to be. And what do you think would happen in our moments of weariness and heaviness and the hard and the pain and the difficult moments of life if we just stopped and considered Jesus. I think at the very least, we would recognize that he understands how we feel. If we considered Jesus, we would remember that he knows what it feels like to come to the end of a day so thoroughly exhausted that he fell asleep on a hard bench in a boat and slept soundly through a storm that was so violent that it threatened to sink the boat and kill everyone inside, and that he only woke up because people shook him so hard 
and said to him, don't you care what's happening? Jesus understands what it's like to be weary. He understands what it feels like to come to the end of all of your strength and all of your energy and just need to collapse in a heap. But even more than empathy, Jesus offers us hope in the middle of our weariness, in the middle of our despair, in the heaviness and the darkness of life. He says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And some of us need to come back to this space to let Jesus teach us how to live in his way, how to allow the invitations that he gives to us to not feel like a crushing weight, but to allow him to restore and renew our souls with something that is light and easy and beautiful and restorative and refreshing. What if we chose to take Jesus at his word and to simply fall into the arms of a good shepherd who promises to lead us into green pastures and to guide us beside still waters in order to restore our souls? Because if we're really honest, some of us are trying to manage or medicate our weariness. We're trying to manage our, we our weariness with food or with entertainment. We're trying to manage our weariness with uh, the people around us or frustration or tension or anger or all kinds of different things. We have so many different ways that we are trying to manage our weariness. And Jesus has run this race perfectly. Jesus was so fully committed to the will of the Father, he trusted it so completely that he ran all the way through suffering and pain and crucifixion and abandonment and betrayal and darkness and death and hell itself and came out on the other side. And he says to us, I am with you always. Come and find rest for your soul. And so today we have these beautiful invitations of Jesus where we are burdened and overwhelmed, where we are hindered and wrapped up in all kinds of destructive and hindering things, he is inviting us to find freedom and wholeness and fullness in him. In the spaces where we are distracted and moving in a thousand different directions or moving hard in one direction that will lead us nowhere, he is saying to us, I want you to fix your eyes on me. Allow me to change your view of life and the world and everything around you. And in the spaces where we are just so weary, and in the spaces where we have lost heart, he invites us to come that we might find rest for our souls. And so what is it that you need today? What's the next task? What's the next step? What is the invitation of Jesus to you this morning? Again, for some of us, you really need to deal with an area of sin or a hindrance in your life, and you know that you really need to deal with this if the idea of fixing your eyes on Jesus seems distasteful. If for some reason you feel ashamed or afraid to look at Jesus, or for some reason you don't even have a desire to get close, you know that there's something in the way. For others of us, the invitation of Jesus today is to continue just to focus our attention on him to allow him to reshape our view of reality and what things are like. And maybe to pursue this today, it's just taking some time every day to say, Jesus, would you fix my eyes on you? Help me to see you as you are. Maybe it's something like taking the bold declarative step in baptism, if you've never done that, to say, I am choosing to follow Jesus. Maybe it's taking something like the Hearing God course to engage more fully. And for many of us today, in the space of weariness, it's the choice to stop trying to manage or medicate our weariness and to simply fall into the arms of a gracious Father and say, Lord, would you restore my soul? Jesus, I want to choose to spend some time with you every day that you would renew me and refresh me. Would you teach me how to live all over again? And again, moments like this run away so quickly and we could finish up the service right now, but you would walk out the door, and five seconds later, the pressure of the world would sink in deeply around you, and you would forget all about this. You'd be distracted. You'd decide you don't really need to work through the things that you need to. And so let's just take a moment right here and right now and just say, Jesus, what do you want to do in me? Maybe there's an area of hindrance or sin that you know you need to work through and you need to talk to someone. Maybe the Spirit of God will prompt you. You should engage with one of the courses that we have or work through something in particular. 
And I want to encourage you to text that person or sign up for that thing or just choose to confess it to him or engage with him in that moment. Maybe he'll invite you to simply rest in his presence. But whatever it may be, let's not let this moment by without taking time to just embrace the presence of Jesus. Because by the grace and mercy of God, he is here right now in this space with us. So just take a moment and fix your eyes on Jesus and ask him what is it that he's inviting you to do or to engage with him on. So, our Father, we come to you. We come to you as ex exactly as we are, with things that are broken, with things that are unfinished, with this areas of distraction, with souls that are full of weariness. And we thank you that as we are, you graciously receive us, but you are never content to leave us there. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves into your hands. We cannot fix ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right. As so we come to you, our gracious and our loving Savior, would you transform us? Would you breathe fresh and new life within us? Would you free us from what holds us back? Would you give us perseverance and capacity to keep our eyes on you and where we are so very weary and where we have lost heart? Would your hope and your joy pour into us? Would you lead us faithfully to be restored in your presence and in your goodness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, just a reminder that following the service, we'll have some people around who would love to pray with you. If there's anything you would like prayer for this morning, we would love to continue this journey with you. And also next week, we have one service at 11.15. It's going to be a great party. We're going to celebrate well the new season that Jesus is inviting us into. And following the service, there'll be a free lunch for everyone. But we're also asking you to bring a dessert to share because I know Pastor Michael in particular is profoundly excited about the range of desserts and he's hoping to try many different things. Uh, and so make sure that uh, that comes together. And as we go now into the week that God has prepared for us, would you feel the strong and the gracious presence of Jesus with you and upholding you? Would the Holy Spirit of God draw you often throughout the course of every day to lift your eyes to Jesus? Let's go into this week and make Jesus known. Amen.